you have your Bibles with you this morning, ask to turn to the Gospel of John, uh, John chapter 20, and we're going to begin reading in verse 18. Uh, while you turn in there, I ask that you still remember Sister Joanne out with sickness, and pray the Lord would uh, uh, heal her body. Gospel of John chapter 20, beginning in verse 18. Gospel of John chapter 20, beginning in verse 18, the Bible says, Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord, and that he had spoken these things unto her. Then the same day, at evening, when the first day, uh, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst, and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had said, and when he had so said, he shewed them his hand, his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them, and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. Uh, they are retained. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, said, uh, saw, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples, therefore, said unto them, We have seen the Lord. And he said unto them, Except I see in his hands the print of nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, again, the disciples were within, and Thomas, saith unto, uh, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and, and behold my hands, and reach thither thy, my, thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered, and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Dear Lord, we thank you and praise you for another opportunity to be with your people God, we praise you for all that you are. Lord, we thank you uh, that Jesus Christ stands in our stead this morning. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that comes and ministers in this place. Lord, we pray that you might send the Holy Ghost this morning and that you might make this word a living word unto us, Lord, that we might uh, grasp the truth that comes with it. God, help us as a church and help us as a people together. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, uh, some fairly familiar verses of Scripture. My question to you this morning is that, do you know Jesus? And a lot of people this morning, I think, know about Jesus, but they don't know Jesus. They, they don't have an intimacy with Him. Uh, they don't know Him as, I know my wife. They don't know them as, I know my brothers and my children. They don't know Jesus. And we live in a day and age today where objects and, uh, and, and uh, things like to be observed that don't have anything to do with God, such as pictures of Jesus and, and pictures of supposedly to marry the mother. And all these crazy things they come up with, but they don't worship Jesus. And the reason they don't worship Jesus is they don't know Him. And if you know him and understand him and he's revealed himself to you, you will worship him. You can't help but worship him. And that's who, uh, that's who the Lord Jesus is. So back to our text verse, the Bible says, Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord. Now, you think about that this morning. First of all, you've got to study the character of Mary Magdalene. You know, the Bible says this to, to, much, uh, uh, much, to those, uh, uh, let me, much is forgiven. So Mary Magdalene was one of those individuals where much was forgiven. The Bible teaches us 
that she had seven demons, seven devils cast out of her. And on top of that, the best we understand, uh, she wasn't a very savory woman to start with. And God saved her from that. Have you ever thought about just the situation and the, and, and, and the things that the Lord Jesus saved you from? That ought to be enough to praise Him and give Him honor and give Him glory. But I want you to see here uh, that Mary was the first one to see Him and said, I've seen the Lord. You know, could you imagine if someone came into this meeting this morning and said, I've seen the Lord? Now, we understand and know that the, the Father, I mean, uh, the Lord Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father, but we also know that Paul saw Him. He saw Him twice, once on the road to Damascus, and another time in his prison cell. And you know what? I believe if somebody came in and said that, we'd be very skeptical, would we not? We, we would be very questioning and say, well, I don't know if that's right or not. And, and, and so in the Gospel of Matthew, in, say, in fact, it says that the apostles, the apostles took what she said as idle tales, as just a story, as something that they did not believe. And you know what? Uh, it ought to get us excited when people see the Lord. And, and not necessarily in, in, in fleshly form, although I don't know that that's outside the realm of possibility, but just see what he does. See that someone's been saved, that someone's been made new, that they have seen the Lord. That ought to excite us. But, it, you know, largely many times it does not uh, get us troubled the way that it should to uh, think about seeing the Lord. Then uh, going on, it says, uh, verse 19, then the same day, meaning later that evening, on Sunday, then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews. Now, they was locked in. If you want to look at it like that, or they were lock locking the Jewish people out so that they couldn't be getting into trouble, so that they would be at less of a risk, or at least that's what they thought, And because uh, the Jews were fixing to come after them and, and try to snipe out him everything the Lord Jesus had done. And so they were in there, and they were fearful. You know, uh, sometimes you go through some fearful times while serving the Lord. Um, Sometimes I think our fears are kind of conjectured in and of ourselves, but the fears are there. And these individuals, they were fearful of what was happening. They, were, they had seen the Lord Jesus crucified three days earlier. And, and now, uh, now that they were fearful for their own lives, it says in the midst of all this fear that the Lord Jesus came walking through the wall. What, what an amazing thing that is to, to see. Could you imagine seeing, uh, you know, we think these walls are protected. You know what that really taught the disciples or it should have? That fleshly walls are not protected to start with. See, uh, the Lord Jesus can go where he wants to. And I believe, uh, as surely as that's true, that demonic presence can pass through this wall anytime. In fact, the Bible says, I believe in the church letter to Ephesus, I know where Satan's seat is. I, I, I know where he positions himself. And, and, and so, first of all, they ought to have learned, listen, this is no protection, but I, the Lord Jesus Christ, I am the protection. I am the one that you need to consider. I am the individual that, that is in control of this thing. So he walks through the walls and he immediately points out the problem. Peace be, to, be unto you. Yeah. You, you. You know what the problem was? They had lost their peace. Anybody know what number of the fruit of the Spirit peace is? Love, joy, peace. It's the third one. And they had lost their peace. And you know what? Just as surely as he was coming in and saying, Peace be unto you, he, the Lord Jesus Christ, is the one that imputes peace. 
When everything else is breaking loose, when, all, when everything else seems like it's a world is at a ride, you know what? I saw a friend of mine uh, that posted on his Facebook that we were just very near the Third World War. And you know what? It well may be. But you know what Christ is saying? He's saying, peace be unto you. Listen, don't get tore up. Don't, don't get discouraged. You know what? The crowd may be dwindling away. You know what the Lord Jesus is saying this morning? Peace be unto you. Don't you worry about this. I've got this. I'm still in control. Peace be unto you. And you know what? World War III may rip the Middle East wide open and it may end up right here on American soil. But I've got something better than that. Peace be unto you. Yeah. And, and he, he's the one that will get the job done. So in the, amid, in the midst of this horrible thing, of losing the Lord Jesus Christ, or so they thought, and the Jews come in after them, he comes in and gives them peace for where they're at. Verse 20, And when he so said, he shewed, him, he shewed unto them his hands and his side. So he, he showed them the nail marks. He, he showed them where he'd been pierced. He showed them where the the soldier had ripped his side open. He verified who he was. See, you know, uh, you know what the difference between us and a lot of so-called Baptists today, where they just invite you to sing a little prayer, is when it's all said and done, I want to know that person knows Jesus. Not, not, not some kind of little yancy yancy song, but they have spent time alone with the Lord. Because you know what? That will last. That will extend even past eternity and even past the fires of hell. It will extend. And, and so I want you to see that the Lord Jesus verified who he was. And my, my question to you this morning, do you really know this Christ? Do you know the Christ of the Bible? And when he had so said, he shoot unto them his hands and his side, then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Now, we're talking about a little bit about your buckets being on the wrong side earlier, but then I want you to see this too, a, a element that is missing today, and the reason that it's missing is because we're looking at everything else around us except the presence of the Holy One, and that is gladness. Once they got it, once they understood, once they saw what it was about, the Bible says, then they were glad. They understood who Christ was. They understood Christ had dominion over this earth. They understood Christ had dominion over sin. They understood who Christ was, and they were glad. And listen, despite what the Catholics say, it's not a man on the cross. Despite what people say, he wasn't a long-haired hippie. He was the Christ. He was the answer to sin. And that, that, that is all in all and in all in all. He is the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, they got it. They were glad. Verse 21. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. In other words, calm down. Grow that peace. Understand who I am. Live in me. Be calm about this thing. Be peace be unto you. As my Father have sent me, even so send I you. Right. Now, we won't spend a lot of time on this because a lot of people will, will rush past that and just say it's John's version of the Great Commission as it's given in Matthew 28. And I kind of get that. But he says... As I was, as the Father have sent me, so, well, how did he send him? You know what? The Lord Jesus did not have an easy life. Right. He was beat up, knocked around, made fun of. Mm. He says, that's the course you're going to go. Even as I was sent to the Father, I'm sending you the same way. So listen, don't get tore up. Right. Everybody's not going to hug your neck. You know what? Uh, I think one of the most hated doctrines that we preach is, listen, you can't do it on your own. You can't be baptized and be okay. 
You can't sing the little, uh, you can't say the little sinner's prayer and everything's going to be cool. It takes the move of the Almighty. Yeah. And they do not like it. Right. They do not like it. And, and, and so, you know what? You're going to get up. If nothing else, you're going to get beat up when people run in their mouths. And sometimes I've seen some people so mad when I'm street preaching, I thought they were going to hit me. But it is what it is. And, and so he says, I'm sending you the same course that I was sent. It's not good. It, it, it's not exciting. It's not going to be fun. But I'm sending you down the course that I went. And you know what? We ought to rejoice as we go down the road and give the Lord the great praise and great honor when we do have to endure these things. That's what he wants. Now, verse 23, I will have to say, it's one verse in the Bible that I don't completely understand. And maybe Brother Jarrett can fix me up on this after church. Who's so, uh, excuse me, let's do verse 22, and then I'll drop down to verse 23. And when he had said this, he breathed on them, saying unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Now, again, and I'm about to move on for about the last year and a half I've been preaching. Don't you deny the Holy Ghost. Don't you, uh, don't you say he doesn't exist. Don't you put him in a corner all by himself. Because you know what? He's part of the Godhead. He, right. he, he is as much God as the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. And he says, listen. And, and you know what happened right here? He just said, I'm going to send you on a rough road. And here's the fuel for it. Here's the strength you're going to need. It's going to take the Holy Ghost to get you through. And, and so we find that he breathes on them, gives them the Holy Ghost, and, and really he's not, the Holy Ghost I mean, is not manifested for a few more days, but they received the Holy Ghost. He breathed on them, and they received it. Now, verse 23 again is the one I'm not sure about, but I'll read it just as the Bible states it. Whosoever sins ye remit, are put back, or set them aside, uh, they shall be remitted unto them, and whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. Now again, I, I'm not going to say I understand all that verse, but that's where your, your Catholics get the idea that the Pope and the priest can forgive sin. That is where it comes from. And again, I don't totally get it, but... I know man can't forgive sin. Amen. And so again, those of you that are a little more studied than I am, you can uh, clear me up on that. But I, you have to include that if you read these scriptures. Verse 24. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. Looks like old Thomas was laid out of church. That's a problem, isn't it? Everybody, you know, Larry, you harp on attendance all the time. Well, that's why. I don't want you to miss something. Yeah. Right? Uh, I don't, if the Holy Ghost shows up, I don't want you to miss it. If a good message comes across the pulpit, I want you to hear it. And, and I believe the Lord was the same way, and we can find that Didymus did have a problem. He missed it. You ever thought about what you missed when you're not at church? Uh, uh, sometimes they get fresh, frustrated at the electronic age. But the other Sunday or two, I was sick, uh, though I was sick, I saw everything was going on right here on my phone from that camera. And you know what? It was an encouragement to me. Because you know what? I don't want to miss nothing. Uh, I, I don't want to be absent. And, and, and so we see then uh, that, uh, that the Lord Jesus had this individual, even then, one of the eleven remaining that laid out and wasn't there. Verse 25, And the disciples therefore said unto them, Very thing that Mary said, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger unto the uh, into the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now that's a pretty bold statement. Listen, you know what? You better be very cautious. Very cautious how you answer people that come in the name of the Lord. 
But even the Lord Jesus had a little bit to say about that. He, 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 he said, in my name spoken. But I want you to see, he had determined within himself, hey, I'm not going to believe it. He had determined within himself, listen, I'm not going to listen to this. I, I don't believe you. People can't raise from the dead. Which was stupid because he saw the Lord raise at least three himself. And, and so we find here that uh, Thomas has this idea, hey, I'm not going to believe unless I lay eyes on the person. You know, I really think that's where these uh, things that's supposed to be angels and people, pictures of Christ. I think that's where the very same spirit that comes from. I'm not going to believe unless I see it. You know what? There's no faith in that. None whatsoever. You know what? I see this pulpit. It's made out of white oak. Feel it? Good and hard. Lasts forever. But if I was blind and one of y'all said, Larry, there's an oak pulpit up on the desk. I'd have to take it as faith, wouldn't I? Yeah. And, and so very much the same way, uh, don't get too hung up in seeing things about Jesus. Verse 26, and after eight days, again, the disciples were then, and Thomas with them, then came Jesus the doors being shut, again, he passing through the wall, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. You know what? I have to believe in those eight interfering days, the eight days in the interim, listen, they done got tore up again. They done started wringing their hands again. They were going, oh, what are we going to do? Listen, uh, what, what's going to happen to us now? The Jews is ready to kill us. So we had to reiterate. Peace be unto you. Listen, don't get tore up. It's going to be okay. You know why? Because I'm on the throne and I'm in control. You know what? If we do go into a third world war, God's in control. Not, not one thing to worry about. Not one thing to stress about. Because God's in control. Now, a bunch of you in this room say you're saved. Have to take that on faith. Right. If you get killed by a nuclear bomb, listen, you, you, you <laughs> it's done. You're home with the Lord. Well, what could be better? Why be upset about that? It's a good thing. And so we find then, as the Lord is speaking, uh, they had an issue with peace. And many times I have an issue with peace. You know, you know what I found? Most people that have an issue with peace that say they are saved already, their problem is this, they don't believe God is sovereign. Because see, if God's sovereign, and everything is under His feet, you know, when He came out walking across the water to the disciples, the water was under His feet. And, and another, another time, the Father, I think maybe Brother Junior read it, he said, uh, uh, I'm my Father one. That's God. And, and, and so, you come down to this. He has to be in it. Now, I don't know, always know why. Don't always understand why. But I do know this. Not one thing happens outside the will of God. It's an impossibility. And, and so, we find then, as the Lord's people, we need to understand and know that we need peace. The commodity for the Christian today is peace because I'm not seeing it among God's people. Verse 27, Then he saith, Thomas, reach hither thy finger and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. Now, uh, we just said that uh, some of the little song watching you. There's an all-seeing eye watching you. Well, I, 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 I want up you. There's an all-hearing ear listening to you. So on this event that was already passed, he said, Thomas, check me out. I'm him. Here's my hands. Here's the side. Do what you want to. Just understand and know that I am God. See, that's what we need. 
And, and I have to take it to this. Now, he loved Thomas, but he didn't like the fact that he doubted. You know what? If you're saved, he loves you, but he don't like the fact when you doubt. And every one of us do from time to time. Every, you know what? Uh, I, I was talking to some preachers one day, and, uh, and Brother Jarrett, you understand this, and you know, sometimes, you know, over, over the years of my ministry, I thought, you know what, I, I just want to quit. I'm done. I can't do this anymore. And then the Lord brings along, and you know, I, brings along encouragement. And I think every preacher goes through that. I'm just done. I can't do this anymore. And then the Lord comes along, and he's talking to these preachers one day, and some of them say, well, I've never felt that way. And I had to sit there and wonder, well, what have you been through? Well, what experiences have you had? Because, you know what, I believe everybody, all believers and, and creatures especially, they go through the flint mill from time to time. And the only thing I come to is this, is uh, God's in it. And he wants us to stand with him. So we find a lot of people... Uh, called Doubting Thomas. That's what he, is, he got his name from. But really, I'd have to say it was little faith Thomas. It wasn't that he was a doubter necessarily. He just didn't have any faith. And a lot of times our actions depict what we do. They depict the fact whether we have faith or not. Now, a lot of people will get the, uh, the uh, idea of faith and faithful like this, they, they don't know the difference. What is faithful? That means you can be counted upon. If you're faithful to work, you show up. If you're faithful to your wife, you don't run around with anybody else. That's being faithful. Now, faith is a little bit different. Faith is how much you trust something. How much you believe in it. I'm faithful to this church. And what drives me to being faithful is I believe that the whole story is true. And that's faith. I don't even say I understand the whole Bible, and I don't think if I live to be a hundred, I ever will. Just like the verse I just read you. But I do have confidence in it. And that's faith. I know it's right. I know it's true. I know it's correct. And, and, and that is the way that we as Lord's people should continually uh, progress as we go through the life that's down here. Then notice what uh, Thomas says. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. See, he understood the person of Christ when he was in direct view of him. Now, the, the, the best I understand, I follow I I this in all three Gospels, he never did it. He never did like this and, and put his hand in there. And he never dug around like this. And you know why? His faith had begun. He didn't have to. Right. That's, that's the difference between faith and your images and stuff like that that you have to see. Yeah. Faith is what it is. Faith is what it is. And, and so we find then, as the Lord's people, that we need to be a people that's built upon real faith and uh, that is how we know the Lord Jesus Christ. If you know him, it's on faith. If you understand him, it's on faith. If he's manifested himself to you, it's on faith. And that's the reason why a lot of times uh, when you come around people and you begin to speak of the things of Christ and they look at you like you got three heads, you know why it is? They have no faith. They don't get it. Don't be discouraged. Don't, don't get upset. Because listen, they don't know what you're talking about. They don't understand the gift of eternal life. They don't understand a personal relationship with the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. They don't get it. So don't be mad at them. Don't be upset. Just walk away quietly and go to praying for them. Yeah. Because you know what? If it wasn't for the goodness of God, you'd be in the exact same boat. And so we find then... As Lord's people, uh, we need to know Christ. We need to understand Him. We need to get rid of that doubt. We need to get rid. 
we need to get to the point where we have some peace. You know, uh, a lot of things happen. And instead of twisting your hands and mummering over them, just have a little faith. Now, I want to go to Acts chapter 9. We won't read a, a lot of it. Very familiar verses of Scripture. The uh, salvation of Paul on his road to Damascus. And I'm just going to read a few verses there and then we're going to go to one other place. Acts chapter 9 in the very first verse. Acts chapter 9. In the very first verse, the Bible says, And Saul, who would become Paul, and Saul yet breathing, breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest, and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, they came near Damascus. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you think he was seeking Jesus? No, but Jesus was seeking him, which is a whole lot better. He'd heard the gospel at the feet of Stephen in Acts chapter 7, verses 53 to the end there, that as he was dying, he said, Lay not this sin to their charge. They know not what they do. He'd heard the gospel, yeah. and it stuck with him. But on this occasion, he wasn't seeking Jesus. Hey, he wasn't looking for him, but, he found, but Jesus found him, which is a lot, lot better than the other way around. Then it says, And suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven, and he fell to the earth, and he heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Now, I want to, I want to capture that in verse 5, it, because he... he Jesus directly refers to the pricks. Now, if you've ever rode a horse and you kind of kick them like this, and some even have spurs on their boots, that pricks them and gets them going the right way. See, he was being pricked of the Lord. I believe since the day that he saw Stephen die, die in the name of the Lord, he said, why did that man do that? I don't understand why he would do something like this. I believe when he laid down his head at night, he could hear Stephen say, Forgive them! They know not what they do! And I believe it tortured him. See, if you don't have something like that, simply you're not saved. Yeah. People don't like that type of preaching anymore, but it is the gospel truth. If you don't have that time where he comes to you and, and through the person of the Holy Ghost, you're found guilty. You're still lost. It don't matter how many times you said your little prayer. You're still lost. And, 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 and I tell you, the best way that you can find that is this. <laughs> do you love the things of God or do you love the things of the world? Verse 6 says, And he trembling and astonished and said, Lord, what will thou have me to do? Now that's a saved man. Uh, he becomes willing to the will of the Lord, willing to what the Lord would have him to do. And he said, Go to the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And you know the rest of that. He uh, was baptized, and he started uh, staying with the believers there at Damascus, and he was, he was baptized. Now, I want you to go with me to Acts 23. Now, if you know if you know your Bible, you know you'll know that he went through some pretty hard knocks in the interim of this. One time, even being left for dead, and the Bible says the Lord raised him up. He'd been so beat around that he was nearly gone, and the Lord strengthened him. You know what? There's not a person under the sound of my voice this morning that's ever took a licking for the Lord Jesus Christ. But it may come. That's why he says, peace be unto you. You know what? I think it would have to be a pretty hard thing to have peace in the, it, with that facing you. 
Now, I'm not much of a fighter, but when I feel threatened, I will fight back. And that's not a good thing. I need to get to the point of peace. Uh, this one's barbed wire. I've got a couple of scars on there that are not barbed wire. You see what I'm saying? And uh, what we need to do is simply have peace. See, that, that's not popular preaching, but that is what's coming. And then you'll do one or two things. You'll cave in or you'll get a good licking. Uh, if, if the, when, when the Lord's appointed time to come, you know what? There may be some rough road. So through all this, after his salvation to the road of Damascus, now in Acts 23, uh, verse 10, we find Paul in prison for preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 10, the Bible says, And when there arose a great dissension or a divide, and it's because the Jews that were there some of them were uh, believed in the resurrection, some were not. And, and, when they arose, uh, and, and when there arose a great dissension, the chief captain, fearing lest Paul should be pulled to pieces of them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him, and take him by force from among them and to bring him into the castle. Now, I want you to notice a couple of things. First of all, um, the king was a rebel. He wasn't a believer. He wasn't a saved person. But God used him, looked over in there, and said, well, they're going to pull him apart. And listen, that wasn't figurative. They literally had him one on one side and one on the other because, uh, and, and you know what? People have died that way. It, it would not be a new thing. And so this ungodly king, not even knowing the person of Christ said, let's get him up out of there and we'll take him to the castle. Isn't it a wonderful thing when you're right in the middle of a problem, right in the middle of difficulty, and the Lord God moves you to the castle? All that protection, high walls up there where nobody can hurt you. And you know what? He's done that for me time and time again. And a lot of times I didn't even see it. I didn't even notice it. And I was sitting in the very protected place of God and, did, and too stupid and unspiritual to understand what God had done for me. And, and so we find then what could have looked like a, a heinous act, he's in the middle of protection. But he's in the enemy's castle. You ever felt like you've been in the enemy's castle? I have. Think that Satan had beat me up so bad there was nothing else left to do. You ever been there? I have. He was alone, too. You know, as a believer, the hardest fight you will ever have is being alone. Now, all of us know Brother Kraft. And uh, I can definitely see this happening. Before he went to Mexico, him and a friend... I want to say they went into Peru or uh, maybe a little bit below that, but it, it was in Central America, but almost into South America, way down there. And uh, they were preaching the gospel on the street corner, and they were arrested. And they were thrown into jail. And his Spanish wasn't near as good then as it is now. And he didn't even know how to plead his case. He didn't know enough Spanish to say, I'm innocent. And he had that buddy with him. And just like Paul and Silas, they began to pray, thank God for the goodness of God. And it wasn't very long, they got sick of the singing, and they let him out. You see, God's good. Yeah. So sometimes you have to go into bondage to appreciate the freedom. Sometimes you have to be locked up a little bit and you're self-limited before you can thank God for what you do have. And, and, and so we find then, as, as the Lord's people, sometimes we look on catastrophe when we should be giving God the praise that it came our way. And, and so I want you to see he was alone, he was locked up uh, in a difficult situation, but verse 24, uh, excuse me, verse 11 and the following night, not the night he went in, so full 24 hours, and the following 
And the night following, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified me of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. Now, what you know what? There, there, there's nothing that you have to interpret it. There's nothing that you have to lose there. The Lord Jesus Christ came to him and said, Fear not, Paul. Very same thing. A little bit different. Peace. You know what robs you of your peace? Fear. What robs you uh, of smooth sailing is fear. Now, this is, this is the challenge, but it's where the believers ought to be. Remember when the Lord said, put them in the very midst of the storm deliberately. And they say, oh, well, God wouldn't do that. Well, you don't have much of a definition of God because when the Lord said, go ye to the other side, he very deliberately put them in the eye of the storm. And you know what? Sometimes he's going to very deliberately do you the same way. That's why I don't like them health and wealth preachers because there's no Bible to it. And, and, and he said, but in the middle, you know what they were doing? They would keep rolling. They were tired, they were exhausted, and they kept rolling and rolling and rolling. And finally in the midst of that, it says they never give up. Ne never quit. Here comes Jesus walking on the sea, and what was his message? Peace be unto you. Yeah. And then Peter got a little brave, so let me walk your way. He said, come on. And then he looked around. Bible says he saw the waves, he, he felt the winds, he saw the waves boisterous, and he started going down. Yeah. See, what you need to do is look at God's plan and not look what's going on around you. Mm -hmm. You know what? Um, and I see this more and more. Listen, the Sodomites are about taking over. You know what? I'm not upset about that. They had two cities once before. So, you know what? The best way I understand from that is going to happen again. So, <laughs> why, why, why be upset? You know what the Bible says in Revelation? There shall be wars and rumors of war. Be ye not troubled. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of rumors of war right now, ain't there? Mm -hmm. Don't bother me. Uh, I remember Thursday last week, and I, you know, of course, when you work with ex military, they're always keyed up about something. And they, uh, I went in and I was doing, you know, talking, we had this meeting, 9 o'clock in the morning. And uh, they said, Larry, what do you think about the situation in, in Iraq? I said, what situation? <laughs> and, you know, they looked at me like I was crazy. But see, God's going to be exonerated either way. And we need to give him praise and glory. Just have peace. Listen, don't, don't let this stuff... And, and you know, things we take as spiritual, sometimes they're not. You know what the Bible says also concerning the last day? In fact, in Matthew 24, in the very same scripture. No, I take that back. The next one is in 2 Timothy. The end cannot come except there be a great falling away. So when you look around and you see a handful of people, just say, you know what, it must be coming. Mm -hmm. We must be getting near. Mm -hmm. Man, what a thrill that is. Be at home with the Lord.